Okay, so let's begin. Uh, we'll get into some nitty gritties of word embedding. And uh, this is the one slide recap. We uh, had a look at the linguistic foundation and the derivation of, and started the derivation of word embedding. Now, we have seen that the word embedding is obtained by setting the uh, weight vector to the hidden layer. The hidden layer is a linear layer. That means it just passes whatever is input to the neuron, just is passed exactly uh, outside the neuron without any change. So it essentially computes y is equal to x. So uh, we started looking at the derivation and today we'll do some uh, simple but intricate uh, mathematical work to understand the uh, weight setting for word vector. Linguistic foundation is that it captures the law, uh, rule of distributional similarity. If two words have very similar contextual words, then uh, their meanings are also similar. Okay, if you reflect on this particular statement, you will, uh, you will understand the depth of the statement that uh, words which have similar environment have a similarity in meaning. So this is a deep statement and uh, surely non-trivial, okay? So uh, for, for, for millennia, for thousands of years, uh, people have pondered on uh, what, what does the meaning of a word mean? What is the meaning of meaning, okay? How do we capture the semantics of a word? Now, this question has been uh, in existence uh, since the time any kind of intellectual activity began. You probably know that uh, linguistics and mathematics uh, are the two oldest uh, systematic intellectual disciplines, okay? By systematic, I mean there are uh, uh, assumptions which are called axioms and then by applying inference rules, you derive uh, new truths. So for example, in Euclidean geometry, there are five axioms and Pythagoras theorem is a result of these five axioms, okay? So Pythagoras theorem is a result of the, uh, the axioms, which are self-evident truth, which cannot be proved or which do not apparently require a proof. They give rise to Pythagoras theorem or the theorem that whenever two straight lines meet, the sum of two angles must be equal to 180 degree. So those are theorems obtained from axioms by using inference rules. So, so for a uh, long time, uh, morphology, that is the words uh, parts and how the morphemes uh, stitch together, okay? So those uh, rules were uh, under, uh, were investigated and described. And the uh, intricate morphological work happened in India, fortunately, okay? Uh, there was a linguist called Panini who uh, gave this massive and very, very disciplined structure of morphosyntax, morphology and morphosyntax. How do words form, okay? How words form from smaller parts, okay? So, vadati, uh, vadati means says, <coughs> okay? Now we begin to see words, vadati, chalati means moves, pashyati means sees, Okay, kathayati means speaks. Why do all these words have T at the end? Okay, what came before, the words or linguistics? Words came before, right? So whenever we have uh, third person singular number present tense, we see a T suffix at the end. Okay, it was not that somebody sat down and prescribed, okay, told the whole community, that all third person singular number present tense verbs will take a suffix t at the end. You better do it, otherwise you will be hanged. No such prescription came. No such order came from the royalty. Or no such injunction came from, came from 
the priests or anybody. It was a behavior, linguistic behavior. Why do all Sanskrit verbs take a T at the end for third person singular number? Why is it that going, coming, seeing, speaking, why do all these words have ing at the end? Nobody prescribed actually. Okay, so this is called uh, uh, the five, uh, you know, if you pr uh, prescribe, then you say that I give you these grammatical rules, you will have to form words and sentences according to these rules. This is called prescriptive linguistics. Okay, it's called prescriptive linguistics. So we have gone through prescriptive linguistics up to class 10. If you have studied English grammar, Marathi grammar, Tamil grammar, Bengali grammar, you have seen prescriptive linguistics. Descriptive linguistics is the way nature is studied, okay? A phenomenon called language is studied as such, as it is. So this is called descriptive linguistics. So think about this, this point, this uh, regularity, okay? Why does ES or S come, comes for goes, comes, tells, speaks? Nobody told, it happened, okay? And then morphologists sat down and they looked at the structure of the words and so, saw that this S seems to be a regular repeating feature for verbs when they're first person, uh, when they're in third person, singular number, present tense. And then a rule emerged, okay? From speak, third person, singular number, present tense, form will be speak plus S, okay? So this is how the rules of linguistics started emerging. Morphology was a very big success, especially for morphologically rich languages. So in India, we saw a, an extremely rich body of knowledge emerge in the form of Paninian Vyakaran. Okay, surprisingly, not much happened in the syntax, the word order. And what was the reason? The reason was that Sanskrit allowed massive amount of free word ordering. Okay, Ramaha, Gramam, Gachati, Ram goes to the village. Gramam, Rama, Gachati is fine. Gachati, Rama, Gramam, okay, no problem. Okay, Ram ne Sham ko dekha, Sham ko Ram ne dekha, both are fine. So morphologically rich languages, what happens is that they allow free word order because they carry the semantic role along with them in the suffix. Okay, Ram ne, ne carries the semantic role that Ram is the karta or agent. So syntax was uh, not, I would say, as intricately and elaborately studied as morphology. So syntax became an extremely powerful method of understanding language, mainly through the work of Chomsky and his, uh, you know, disciples. So that gave rise to what is called generative grammar, context-free grammar, for example, capture some amount of linguistic phenomena. But language is a living object. Whenever anybody tried to bind, okay, language in a framework, tried to discipline language, so to say, language always rebelled, okay? And new structures emerged, a new language emerged from its parent, okay? For example, Bengali, Hindi, Marathi, all of them emerged from Sanskrit through Pali. You cannot chain language in a compartment, not possible. People tried but failed. That language became dead or not used very much. Now when new structures emerge, naturally grammatical rules also will have to be expanded. And when you expand grammatical rules, in internal inconsistency may arise. Okay, if you say all sentences have to begin with noun, then the phenomenon of imperative sentences, go there, is not accounted for. Go there is a valid sentence, but it begins with a verb. Okay, so generative grammar through context-free languages tries to capture, tried to capture syntactic phenomena, and that succeeded mainly for English and fixed word order languages, where you cannot take much liberty with the word order. Now, word order is important for semantic role. 
when we do positional encoding for transformers, we will come back to the importance of positions as they capture semantics. Okay, so transformers, uh, one of the uh, features of transformers other than attention, attention is also a linguistic phenomenon. When you take a sentence, pairs of words have more affinity between themselves with respect to another word. Okay, there is money in the bank. Money and bank have closer affinity than in and bank. Okay, they are, they are semantically closer. And very uh, interestingly, the fact that money and bank are close to each other is captured by the word vector. Okay, very interestingly. And since they are captured by the word vector, we say that word vectors capture semantics of the words. So this is a computational lens at the meaning of a word, computational lens. There are many lenses. You can take a philosophical lens to artificial intelligence. What we do here is we take a com uh, computational lens to language. Hmm? For us, the object of interest is language, bhasha, hmm? the vehicle which is <coughs> used for communication. That's our uh, object of interest and we take a computational lens at the uh, at bhasha. Now syntax or the word order has been studied very deeply. Parsing is one of the richest branches of uh, systematic study of language. Semantics has been a bit uh, difficult to tackle. Okay, In India we have this tradition Mimangsa and Nyai. Nyaya deals with inferencing or logic. Mimangsa deals with knowledge representation. We represent by word vectors, word meanings. We represent by sentence vectors, sentence meanings. Vectors capture meaning. Okay. Now which component captures which meaning is the problem of interpretability of vectors. Okay. So now coming back to this discussion. Uh, the, the linguistic foundation for word vectors is distributional similarity, okay? And I always, uh, you know, get a kind of, uh, uh, I would say a kind of excitement thinking that here is a, uh, here is a handle at the, uh, the elusive notion of semantics. I don't know what semantics is. I know the context of the word, that for me is semantics, okay? And that is captured by word vectors. Now, now here steps in another um, powerful instrument, the data science or probability. This steps in. It says that, okay, from language, from language phenomena, I know that uh, semantics is, uh, uh, semantics is tackled by context. Good. This is the phenomenon. What model or instrument do I use to capture this? Very simple idea. Maximize the probability of the context words. For bank, maximize the probability of money. Maximize the probability of interest. Maximize the probability of the phrase purchasing power. All these go with money. Okay. If you think deeply, is there anything called, uh, is a word useful by itself? No. Words derive their utility from their relationship with other words. No. Because that is what forms a sentence, a paragraph, a chapter, a, a vehicle of communication. So that is captured. Now this is another intriguing phrase, phrase. Probability of maximizing the context. The context is there. Okay. This bank gives good interest. There is money in the bank. These contexts have already appeared. What is the meaning of uh, maximizing the probability? No, the maximizing the probability because there is money in the bank is one of the many possibilities of you know, stringing together K words. 
I could pick up any k words and then uh, produce a string of words. They may or may not be sentences. They may or may not be a sentence which conveys the meaning of there is money in the bag. Okay, now take a computational lens again and see that there is a <coughs> you know huge, huge conceptual space of words and the possibility of stringing them together. So I start with any random sequence of words and gradually refine it to form a meaningful sentence. Which, which computational mechanism does this, do you know? There is a very, very popular mechanism now which converts noise into structure by training. Stable diffusion. So we are doing some research into this. Start with a random sequence of words and see if you can form a sentence out of this. Before that, we are trying to see, start with a random sequence of characters and see if words emerge out of this character cloud or character noise. Okay. So I believe I'm digressing, but all these are very important statements. And uh, even if I'm not going in a systematic linear fashion, I believe these are interesting things. Okay, sh you should know this. Then probability steps in and says that, well, I'll uh, capture this linguistic phenomenon of maximizing, of giving definiteness to the context, and here uh, probability steps in very nicely. Then we also <clears throat> discussed the notion of one hot embeddings. This is also very ingenious, okay? I start with something, I have to start with something. That start, uh, starting point is one hot embedding, which is a string of zeros, except that one location is one, which corresponds to the location of the word in the vocabulary. Then we spent some time discriminated, discriminative versus generative modeling. And we took the nice example of sentiment analysis because it shows the distinction very clearly. The distinction is not very clear for machine translation. Machine translation is not a good uh, example to illustrate the difference between discriminative and generative. Okay, sentiment analysis is. Why? Because C star, the winning category out of the three categories of positive, negative, and neutral is argmax over C, probability of C given S, where S is the sentence <coughs> and C is the category of sentiment, positive, negative, neutral. So the winning category is C star, argmax of C over probability of C given S. Just to remind you, Max y is equal to max of x gives you the value of y, uh, and arg max x gives you that value of x which maximizes fx. Y is equal to fx. Okay, so here take that value of c which gives you the maximum probability probability of c given s. Approach two: you apply Bayes theorem and work with probability of c into probability of s given c. Hmm? Yes, so this term is called the likelihood, this is called the prior probability, and uh, uh, this, this whole thing is the posterior probability. Hmm? That this product divided by probability of S is the posterior probability. So this is because of the application of Bayes theorem. In approach one, we, the name given is discriminative because features like adjectives give rise to the classification. For example, Wonderful is a strong indicator of positive sentiment. So the feature of wonderful discriminates successfully amongst three categories, giving the decision as positive sentiment. The acting was wonderful. On the other hand, if you work with this expression, what is this expression? Probability of S given C. Probability of S given, yeah. So C is the category. So positive sentiment gives rise to features like a positive adjective, which is wonderful. So it's a different way of looking at the problem. There is the hidden underlying uh, phenomenon of positive sentiment. That positive sentiment gets manif manifested as the adjective wonderful. That's why generative. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a, an important uh, 
important conceptual framework important to understand. Let us proceed. So, linguistic foundation is this uh, Harris's distributional hypothesis 1970. Words with similar distributional properties have similar meanings. Uh, 1950, uh, first say the word is known by the company it keeps, a rather dra dramatic statement, but uh, useful to memorize these principles. And it models differences in meaning rather than the proper meaning itself. Okay. So, uh, uh, so though I loosely say it, that the contextual neighborhood is the meaning, actually it is more accurate to say that this principle uh, models the differences in meaning. So, therefore, you can, uh, you can say that the dog, the word dog is more similar to cat than lamb. Okay, and the difference in meaning between dog and lamb is more than that between dog and cat. You can make this kind of <coughs> statements. Okay, and uh, this is the skip gram architecture where we have a hidden layer. This layer is linear. It, every neuron here in this layer computes y is equal to x, just passes the input forward. The input is a one hot vector of the word I am interested in. This is the word for which I need a word vector. The word vector is the uh, set of words going from the one neuron, activated neuron, to the hidden layer. The dimension of the hidden layer is D, where D is a design decision and it is the length of the word vector. This last uh, layer, I call them a sequence of compartments where you have one hot vectors of the contextual words. Here we show two words before, two words after. Okay. Right. So this is the skip gram architecture. In CBO architecture, the contextual words will come. Hidden layer is there, of course, and there is a target vector. Okay, now uh, when to use SIBO, when to use skip gram? Uh, I had given a quiz question once which showed that the number of parameters, mm, yeah, oh, oh sorry, the complexity of uh, backpropagation algorithm is more in SIBO than uh, skip gram. I will see if I can uh, you know, fish that quiz question out and show the answer to the class. Okay. So, this is the skip gram architecture and uh, we all already discussed the similarity between dog and cat being more than dog and lamb. So, the input vector for dog if the uh, skip gram network is given the input of dog, then the output will be vectors of the associated words or the context contextual words. So the words which emerge at the output layer for dog and cat will be will be more similar compared to dog and lab. Okay. The encoder decoder deep learning network is nothing but the implementation of the Harris's distributional hypothesis. Okay, let us uh, proceed. Now, what is the learning objective in skip gram? We know that uh, in the skip gram, we try, try to maximize the probability of getting the contextual words, their one hot vec vectors, given the target input word. How do we get, uh, the, we get probability out of a neural network? We get it by softmax. Okay, softmax is the mechanism by which we get a probability distribution. Okay, now uh, I'll directly come to the loss function. We would like to minimize this loss, which is minus t equal to one to capital T, j equal to minus m to plus m, j not equal to zero, where j equal to zero means the target word. Okay, it's a w t plus j is the word. So, uh, this notation essentially means that 
theta is the parameter space for the network. That is all the weight values and the threshold values of the network. Wt is the target word. So this is t plus 0. J uh, going from minus m to plus m. That means left neighborhood to right neighborhood. m words in the left, m words in the right. Uh, but exclude the word itself, the target word itself. OK? So we uh, maximize the log of this probability value. In other words, we minimize this loss which is uh, summation of log of p, which means product of this, uh, these probabilities. The assumption is iid, okay? These contextual words probability, are, uh, th these words are independent of each other, which is again not true, okay? If they're independent of each other, how are they forming a sentence? Okay, clearly a wrong assumption, but okay, we can work with this. And t equal to one to capital T means for all words. For every word, look at two words before, two words after. Take the log sum and take the sum of the log sum over all that words. This is how it is done. Okay, so these are loss function. Now, suppose we want to uh, say probability of bark given dog should be maximized. Now, we are going from requirement to representation. Okay, let me repeat this point. We are going from requirement to representation. This is another uh, moot and subtle point. The whole of deep learning based NLP is really concerned with representation. We have characters, phrases, sentences, paragraphs, chapters. These are symbolic representations can't do with symbolic representation. We need numbers, okay? So we need a mechanism of converting symbols to numbers, okay? So this is the whole representation business. I have some important things to say about them. So we take the weight vector from dog neuron to the projection layer, that is the Hinnell layer. We, uh, we call this uh, U-dog. Take the weight vector to bark neuron from the projection layer. Can we give such names to neurons? Dog, bark, bank, river, and so on. We can because these are one hot representations. Okay. So, uh, so the, uh, this from and to are valid prepositions here. So when initial, initialized, u dog and v bark give the initial estimates of the word vectors of dog and bark, the weights and therefore the word vectors get fixed by back propagation. Now, uh, to model the probability, we first compute the dot product of u dog and v bark, exponentiate the dog produ dot product, and take so softmax over all dot products over the whole vocabulary. So probability of bark given dog is e to the power similarity of dog and bark divided by a normalizing factor, which consists of e to the power, uh, similarity of dog vector and other words in the vocabulary. Okay, this is the expression. So uh, this is an important uh, thinking point. Why cannot we model probability of bark given dog as the ratio of counts of bark dog and dog in the corpus? Why this way of modeling the probability through dot product of weight vectors of input and output words, exponentiation, and then soft maxing. Okay, why not simple ratio of counts? You should think about that. Now we work out a simple case of word to vec. Let's take these four words. Okay, oh, yeah. Yeah. Ratio of counts of bark, or is it uh, co-occurrence count, or is it sequential bark, then dog, dog, then bark as well? Co-occurrence count. Because bark and uh, dog should be co-contextual. They should be in the same context. Hmm. So before taking the stick we have WT plus 1 and WT plus 4. Hmm. So when calculating WT plus 2, will WT plus 1 also affect it? Come again? I mean, like if I have a dog, hmm. next time I'm trying to calculate the next two words of 
So based on that, if I consider, if I know the second next word, based on that, the other word will also be affected at the same time. So will, it, will this be considered? Yes. So uh, I take doc. And for one sentence, I find that the context words are bark and thief. And police and uh, and arrest. I take another sentence where dog appears. Now it has four different words. So all these become training data for me. Okay. So I will impress dog here and demand the four words for dog, contextual words. Again, impress dog and demand another set of four words or some of them may be repeated. Then I do the same for cat, then river, then water, and so on. As I keep doing it, as I keep doing it, I, uh, I get weight values for these collections. Okay? And then uh, I am able to get the word vectors of individual words. How? I'll just come to that. Okay. Yeah. So, in the, by changing the syntax, also will it become in between the words? Yeah. Yes, yes. The weight will settle to uh, some value which uh, tries to give some probability to all possible context words. <laughs> some probability. Try to assign some optimum way. Yeah. So one foundation which needs to be discussed in the class is the bias variance trade-off. Hmm? So I have I have the first inst instance of dog and its and its context. Then dog two C two. Doc K, C K. So I have uh, K training data instances. These are positive data. Now we know that learning only from positive data is not possible. We have to give negative data also. So dog and a set of words which are not in the context of dog. Okay, and that's another intricate matter because negative examples can be anything else. So there you have to use what is called uh, uh, negative sampling and so on. Okay, let's not worry about that. So this will give me some kind, some weight vector. This will give me another weight vector and so on. Ultimately, through iteration, I'll come to a weight vector which tries to maximize the probability of all these contexts. So if, if this is the training data instances, okay, then maybe I settle to, settle into a, uh, a, a, a conceptual surface which goes through all of them but does not touch any of them. It's possible. Okay, so here uh, bias variance trade off plays an important role. Who can explain bias variance trade off very clearly? So maybe we should have one, you know, one a part of the lecture devoted to bias variance trade off, because this is very important for LLP. The training data is very complex, and the chance of overgeneralization is very high. Yeah. Yeah. But the word vector is much much smaller. Okay, so I have four words. That is my vocabulary. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, by, uh, bias of a model would be how strictly it uh, assumes, the, uh, how strict its assumption about the data is. As in, if the data is in one particular form, it would fit, otherwise it won't fit. So, uh, that is bias, whereas variance is giving a mean performance of the model considering all data sets, how does, how does it differ from that mean performance? So, uh, in, con uh, in context of training and testing, it becomes, if the 
training performance is this, how much variability the model will show with respect to the training set, uh, which uh, connects with generalization power. If it generalizes well, it will show less variability uh, from the train, uh, training versus the testing, otherwise it will show higher variability. The mathematical expression for bias and mathematical expression for yeah. Okay, I will take the mathematical expression and also build an intuition for it. And inductive bias, inductive bias. Let's sp spend a few minutes. So, this is the data. Okay. This is data for what? Does it represent the data? This is our operator. Does it represent the data? <coughs> if x1 and x2 are same, y is equal to 0, else 1. Does it represent the data? With appropriate weights, does it represent the data? Four representations for the data. Inductive bias is which out of k representations you decide to output your hypothesis in. That is inductive bias. Given the data, a priori I assume that it is, the, it, is a, uh, it fits a line. The moment I have decided this, then I have entered into inductive bias. Out of many possibilities for hypothesis expression, which one have you chosen? That is the inductive bias. And that inductive bias is one of the contributing factors to bias variance trade-off. Okay. So we have four words. If the vocabulary has four words, what is the size of the one odd vector? Four. So now I have ordered the four words as follows, heavy, light, rain, and shower. They are lexicographically ordered. Heavy, light, rain, and shower. So then heavy is represented as 0, 0, 0, 0001. Light as 0, 0, 1, 0. Uh, rain as 0, 1, 0, 0, shower as 1, triple 0. Now, we want to predict as follows. If I see heavy, then I want to predict rain as a very likely contextual word. Let's say there is only wo one word in the context, heavy rain. And for light, the maximum probability should be going to shower. Okay, so given heavy, I can have heavy again as the output of the machine. I can have light, rain, shower, anything, but the probability of rain should be highest. Similarly, inputting ray, uh, light should give the highest probability to shower. 
So any biogram is theoretically possible, but actual probability differs. For example, heavy, heavy, heavy light are possible, but unlikely to occur together in the context. Language imposes constraints on what biograms are possible. Domain and corpus impose further restriction. That's important. Okay. Heavy rain is uh, a frequently occurring biogram. You see that. But what will you do if your corpus doesn't have that biogram? That is another constraint. Okay. Some constraint comes from the way language behaves. Another constraint comes from the data you have. And many times we are slave to the data. We can't do anything better than what your data affords. You are at the mercy of the data. Okay, unless you have some way of generalization. How do you generalize? You generalize by injecting knowledge. Take the data, train a machine learning model, but also have assistance from a knowledge graph. That's a very powerful way of, uh, you know, solving the constraint imposed by data. So then we have uh, the input output pairs as heavy uh, 0001, light 0010, rain 0100, shower 1000. And then in the output again, you have any of the four words. So that's what I will demand while I train. Now I want for heavy, which is U0, the 0th word, 0001, I want the output to be V2. So U for inputs, V for outputs. V2, 0, 1, 0, 0. Uh, Why V2? Because uh, the words have been lexicographically ordered. Heavy, light, rain, shower. V0, V1, V2, V3. U0, 1, U2, U3. Light shower, given U1, get V3. Because shower is V3. Now this is the network and it captures the essence of the construction of what to back, the skip gram network. What do I see? I have the four neurons here, okay? And I have, I have, uh, I have my design is such that I'm interested in only one context word. So therefore, there will be only one word. And therefore, there will be four neurons standing for that word. Four neurons in the input layer, four neurons in the output layer. I have decided that my word vector length will be two. Word vector length is typically much, much smaller than the one hot vector length. How much smaller? Typically, one to 10 percent, typically. Now, uh, the an interesting aside. So. Uh, the, the vocabulary of English is how much? Any guess? What is the vocabulary size of English? Today's Times of India reported this. What could it be? Some guess. Hmm? 10 million. 10, no. 100,000 to 200,000. Close. Apparently, it is 2,68,432. Okay. Yeah. So, I don't know how they counted this, but you can always uh, create a new word. Okay. My, my roll number is X alpha 321. You've created a new word. And if it is in the corpus, it has gone to the English vocabulary. That is the data vocabulary. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. So, uh, so about uh, two lakh sixty thousand is what we come to know, right? So, two lakh sixty thousand. Ten percent would be how much? Twenty six thousand. That is too too big. One percent would be about two thousand six hundred, but it is even smaller. Typically. 1,000, maybe 1,500, that is the length. So let's uh, look at the uh, quiz one questions and answers. 
and after that you can write your cribs okay, if you're not satisfied. So first question was uh, spot the odd man out and it was given in bracket consider the relationship between junk and the next word. The four words are junk food, junk jewelry, junk yard and junk car. So food that is junk, valueless, rotten. Jewelry that is valueless, not actual gold, maybe artificial. Yard that is valueless, yard that is junk. Junk car, car that is junk. So the odd man out is C because the relationship that holds between junk and the next word is common for A, B, and D. C is the odd man out. Any objection? And if the objection takes a long time, then you'll have to write it in the crib and we'll get into it. But is, okay, is it okay? Yeah. Okay, so what relationship? Huh? Junk yard, where the yard is junk. Yeah, yeah, so I'm saying which is the odd man out? <laughs> okay, if you, yeah. Acha. So I see. So the, hmm. So, so what is what is your uh, odd man out? None of this. And <laughs> so, yeah, so for you, what is the odd man out? No, junk jewelry is also appear in the context. Yeah. You know, there is an expression called junk jewelry. Okay, so so yeah, if you have objection, please write it. But I I don't think you have a very strong objection. <laughs> next one, next question. Here your foundation is required. Okay. Yes. Please don't talk. So a perceptron computes x1 implies x2. And the truth table of x1 implies x2 is such that uh, only when x1 is 1 and x2 is 0, the total value is 0. Okay, otherwise the value is 1 always. The parameters are w1, weight of the connection to which x1 is input, w2 for input x2 and theta the threshold. Which of the following options that are independent of one another are false? Which of the following options are false? So here you really have to set up, set up the inequalities. Okay, otherwise there is every chance that you will go wrong. Inequalities are as follows. When, uh, only when x1 is 1 and x1 multiplies w1, is it visible on the teams also? Hmm? Hmm. So x1 is 1 and w1 and x2 is 0. So here I want my output to be 0. So this sum, net sum should be less than theta. Otherwise in every case the net sum is greater than theta. So as a result of these inequalities what we get is theta has to be negative. W1 has to be still more negative. W1 has to be less than theta. 
W2 has to be greater than theta and W2 plus W1 has to be greater than theta. So you can see that if theta is negative, W1 also has to be negative and if uh, W2, 1 plus W2 must be greater than theta, W2 uh, will, will, will have to com compensate the value of uh, W1, okay. So let's, let, now let's see the options. Theta is equal to 1.0 is not possible because theta has to be negative. W1 uh, is equal to minus 2 and theta is minus 1 is possible. Now you choose W2 accordingly. W2 minus 0.5 theta minus 1.0 is not possible. If W2 is negative and W1 is negative anyway, W2 and W2 plus W1 greater than theta is not possible. Not possible, right? Because W1 is already less than theta. So third option is not also possible. And such a perceptron is not possible is not possible because a perceptron like this exists. I have given you the inequalities and from this W1, W2 and theta can be fixed. For example, W2 can be plus 3, okay, for the second option. W2 can be plus 3, W1 minus 2, theta minus 1 is a valid set of parameters. Okay, so A, C, D all are false. B is all right. And I don't think you can answer this without setting the inequalities properly. Okay, any objection? No. We have a two input odd parity network. So two input odd parity is nothing but XOR network. That is the network outputs one if the sum of inputs is odd, otherwise zero. The network has a single hidden neuron. The inputs are x1 and x2 and the output is y. The two threshold values are t1 for the hidden neuron and t2 for the output neuron. The weights are w1 from x1 to the hidden neuron, w2 from x2 to hidden neuron, w3 from x1 to output neuron, w4 from x2 to output neuron, W5 from hidden to output neuron. Do not include the equal to test. Which of the following are true? So here for answer for answering this question, I think most of you have drawn the network, no? Otherwise, this text can be confusing. This is the network. So it is not possible to such a, have such a network is not possible. That's false. Because this computes the XOR function if if this is 1.5, this threshold is 0 0.5, all the weights are 1. This computes XR. Okay, because if X1 and X2 are both 0, the output will have to be 0. 0 comes from here also. Okay, 0 0.5 is the threshold, so output is 0. 0, 1, 0, 1, uh, this will not send out anything because here the threshold is 1.5. So input is 1. Output from here is zero. But this uh, one here and zero here will exceed the threshold of 0.5. So output will be one. Similarly for one, zero. The tricky part is the one and one. So when one and one are impressed here, 
then a then a one comes out from here okay and this is minus 2 this is minus 2 so when both are 1 plus 2 comes through these jumping weights okay and minus 2 comes from this neuron so that compensates for the whole sum and it becomes 0 output is again 0 so if this is uh, outputting 1 only for 1 and 1 then this is computing and hmm? so such a network is possible first option is not correct and the hidden neuron computes the and function okay possible hidden neuron computes the or function no and none of the given options is true is also not correct I don't think you can compute uh, you can compute this by hidden uh, hidden neuron computing or you are able to you are able to oh what are the weights uh, uh. Achha. okay just uh, put it in the cribs hmm? so you can this can compute or and the whole network can compute x or so then the answer should be b and c both okay so write it in the crib and we'll see okay now four so question number four is uh, question number four you can say is an irritating question okay the the proof of convergence of the perceptron training algorithm is an example of proof by induction no contradiction yes refutation yes refutation and contradiction mean the same and you have both the phrases yeah really so you, have, you, 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 the mathematicians use both the phrases: proof by contradiction, proof by refutation, and proof by enumeration. No, justification, contradiction, and refutation mean the same. The proof comes to the conclusion that G W N gets unbounded, which is not possible. If you see the perceptron training convergence proof, we start with G W N, which is W N dot W star divided by mod of W N. This is bounded and it cannot become unbounded unless it converges. So this proof by, so you have to give both the terms. I, I, I heard some creeps that uh, you chose only B, but B and C both have to be chosen. It is an NLP class, okay? So contradiction, refutation mean the same thing. There is, uh, you can also then say that, sir, then why not prove by opposition? Okay, because opposition is also some kind of contradiction, but nobody uses that term. Okay, it is not a accepted phrase in the language. Next one. Okay. Uh, next one is also what we call as uh, insight question. A perceptron training algorithm is run on the label data of a binary classification problem, as discussed in the class. W star is a required weight vector and Wn is the uh, weight vector at the nth step of the perceptron training algorithm. Which of the following is the sheer uh, short signal the data is not linearly separable? A week has passed with the PTA running non-stop and the algorithm has not converged still. And uh, that is not a sheer, sheer short uh, signal. It can converge after maybe 1 million years. B, for some k greater than or equal to 0 and j greater than 0, wk equal to wk plus j. So the weight has repeated. The moment the weight repeats, you know, surely it is not a linearly separable problem. Why? Coming to that. The magnitude of wn is strictly decreasing. No, no such guarantee. The magnitude of Wn is oscillating, that also is not a shear short signal. Why B is a shear short signal? 
with this because of this. We observe W star dot W n is equal to W star dot W n minus 1 plus x failed. You went into x n because x n minus 1 failed for some vector. So this is equal to W star dot W n minus 1 plus d where d is positive because W star is the required vector. Its dot product with any vector will have to be positive. Remember the perceptron training algorithm. So W star dot W1 has to be strictly monotonically increasing. Okay, so since W star is common, no W uh, k and W k plus j can be equal. Otherwise, this strictly monotonically increasing property is violated. Okay, so if uh, this equality is not possible, but W k and W k plus j have appeared, they are not impossibilities. So what is impossible? W star is impossible. If W star is impossible, then the data is not linearly separable. A piece of beauty, absolutely, right? Hmm? And this is also a proof by contra uh, contradiction or refutation. Okay. Any objection? Hmm. Uh, B is a special case of D. Oscillating need not be equal. No, but oscillating okay, but uh, it need not have period so regular periodicity. Right. So oscillating means that there has to be two values equal sometime. Uh, yeah. Not so. Yeah, maybe, but you see, isn't B a? You should you should straight away target B. Oh, acha both. Oh. Okay, write, write it, write it in the crib. Okay, now we come to uh, six. The property of human languages that enables speakers to talk about places and times where they are not physically present at the time of speaking is called, uh, is called which one? Displacement. This I think all of you have got. Uh, but do appreciate this very powerful property of human language. You may not be present at a place and time, but still talk about it. Tremendous capability. See the definition of displacement. Question number seven. So these question number seven and eight link uh, neural network with la language phenomena. Suppose a sentiment classification rule is if the number of positive adjectives in a sentence is more than the number of negative adjectives, then the sentence has positive sentiment, else not, else not. Identify the options that are correct. A single perceptron with binary inputs, one and zero only, can do this job. A single sigmoid neuron with binary inputs, one, one and zero only, can do this job. A single perceptron can do this job provided the adjectives are from a particular domain. That's nonsense. And none of the given options is true. What is the correct answer? Let there be n of, uh, adjectives in the vocabulary. This is a bit tricky. Hmm? Have a perceptron with n inputs. Represent each positive adjective's presence as plus 1 and that of each negative adjective as minus 1. Absent adjectives are represented as zero. Then a weight vector with all components as one and threshold as uh, 
Yes, and the threshold as 0 0.5 will do the job. Working only with ones and zeros in the input will not do the job. Okay, so if you have a threshold of 0 0.5 and if the number of positive adjectives is more than number of negative adjectives, then the net input will be at least one. Okay, and then the output will be one. Why only zeros will not work? Because uh, then the padding, the padding that comes will interfere with the judgment of the perceptor. Okay, and uh, this problem is called a majority problem. Majority problem is solvable, is linearly separable. Okay, here is a skip, yeah. C, a single perceptron can do this job provided the adjectives are from a particular domain. No, domain restriction is not in it. Yeah. Provided, the provided it's a strict condition. Provided the adjectives are from a particular domain. Because it's, it looks like a necessary condition that the adjectives, all adjectives have to come from a particular domain. Yeah. What if, if, if the sentence contains the same adjective twice, that's okay. Uh -huh. But I, I do not say unique adjectives, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I just say it appears. So So can you find a counter example to this rule? Uh -huh. No, no. So, so this is this is a camera with wonderful, wonderful lens, but horrible color. This is a camera with wonderful, wonderful lens, but horrible color. So, in this case, the num the you will have only one one, and a, a negative adjective is minus one. So the net input will be zero. So the decision will be zero. Okay, decision will be zero. So you are. So what is your objection? You are saying that it is violating uh, definition of sentiment or. It is not. Uh, we are. We are. We are only uh, setting the neuron as one if the adjective is present. That's all. So I don't see uh, where is the failure. So, so it is. It is a camera with wonderful, wonderful lens, but horrible, uh, horrible weight. So the sentiment is coming out to be non-positive. The sentiment, the perceptron will say non-positive. Why? Number of oh. We can adjust the justification rather than saying plus one for each adjective to say number of counts of that. So two times one plus one plus 
Yeah. yeah, then then which option will hold is the question, right? So okay, so write it, we'll see. Hmm? What? So, which option have you chosen? So, all all A, B, C are possible. No, all uh, which are correct. So, the answer is the none of the given option. So you have chosen A. Hmm? You have chosen A. Okay, take it. So write it, please. Huh? I'll go back. Then uh, question number eight again uh, links language phenomena with perceptron. Uh, yeah, just just maintain a bit silence. An emotion plus analyzer uh, that also gives the intensity of the emotion along with the Emotion <clears throat> applies the rule that if any one of the two adjectives, happy and delighted, appear in the sentence, then the sentence has emotion, moderate joy, otherwise not. Identify the correct option. So this is this this you can see is an XOR problem. Right? If if both options, if both adjectives are present, the answer is no. If one of the adjectives is present, the answer is yes, that is moderate joy. If neither of the two adjectives are present, then it will be zero again. Right. So identify the correct option. A single perceptron can do the job? No, because it is XOR problem. A single sigma neuron can do the job? No, a single sigma also cannot do XOR. A single perceptron can do the job provided the sentences are from a particular domain? No. None of the given options is true. I think I copied uh, the two options here, so that might be the problem. But let's see. So this, any objection? Hmm. No, moderate joy is, is, is possible only if one of them is present. It is mentioned. Uh, it, uh -huh. If any one of the two adjectives, happy and delighted, appear in the sentence, then the sentence has the emotion moderate joy, Other else not covers that. No, no, no. <laughs> no, any one. So you interpret any one as both also? Oh, I see. Okay, write it. Okay, but anyone in, in my mind is only one of them. Okay. Then following is the conversation between two persons P1 and P2 with accident induced brain damage. Lot lot of talk going on there. Can you please be silent? Lot, lot of following is the conversation between two persons P1 and P2 with accident induced brain damage. P1. What city stay you? P2, city, city, city flies in the sky. Which of the following is are true? Broca's area damage for P1, that's correct. Broca's area interferes with syntax. Warnicke's area damage for P1, no. Warnicke's area interferes with semantics. Broca's area damage for P2, no. Syntax is fine. City, city, city flies in the sky. Warnicke's area damage for P2. Okay. Also remember that these questions are people who have who are going through a course, not for somebody outside the course. Okay, so there is a context to these questions. Question number 10, last question. With respect to this network, the partial derivative of O naught with respect to W11 and that of O1 with respect to W11 are different in magnitude now. 
same in magnitude, same in sign, no, different in sign. Okay, so this you must have all got. This is if you differentiate the softmax, uh, uh, if you differentiate the softmax with respect to its own input and with respect to the input of another neuron, then the result comes out. Okay, so whatever objection you have, please write in the crib sheet and we'll get into it.